Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to ASCO seminar series. I think we can get started. This is Jiang. I'm the seminar coordinator, and together with me is Ms. Kathy Medley. She's our communication and IT specialist. Kathy and I will be today's moderator. And just so you know, then this seminar is being recorded, and we will put the video recording on our ASIC YouTube channel. You are welcome to bring up any questions. You might notice that we changed the uh, uh, format a little bit. Uh, basically, everyone can unmute yourself, and if you can also turn on your uh, webcam uh, if you want to talk to the uh, speaker in our Q and A session. And um, there might be some. Uh, so we looked at some uh, echoes just now. So uh, if you have a headset, you might want to use it because uh, then can reduce the echo. And today we are very excited to have our speaker. Uh, and okay, let, let me take a look. Okay, uh, I think uh, we are good. We don't have an echo. And today we are uh, very excited to have our um, speaker, um, Professor um, Sue Ben Heber, um, joining us from Colorado State University. So, Professor um, Ben Heber is a a Montford Professor of Amherst Physics Science at Colorado State University. She joined the CSU faculty in 2008 after receiving her um, bachelor's degree in mathematics from the University of Witwatersrand in South Africa and her PhD in Amherst Physics Science from Colorado State University. Her research is focused on deep convective cloud process in particular, microphysical and dynamical feedbacks, code pool dynamics, and aerosol cloud interactions. And she oversees the development of Grant's model. Dr. Van Heber teaches graduate classes in cloud physics, cloud dynamics, and mesoscale scale modeling, and co authored the book Storm and Cloud Dynamics. She's a fellow of American Meteorological Society and has received the American Geophysical Union Essen Award, the MS Edward Lawrence Teaching Excellence Award, the MIT Anston Lecture Chief Award, and several CSU teaching and mentoring awards. She is an editor of the Journal of Amherst Physics Science, co chairs of the uh, GWEX Aerosol and Precipitation Initiative, and recently co chaired the Science Community Committee SCC of NASA's ACCP um, pre formulation study. Let's welcome the speaker, and uh, I will give the board to speaker to the speaker. So, Professor, please proceed. Well, thanks very much, John, and thank you for that gracious introduction and for the invitation to talk here today. It's really super to be with you all. And today I'm going to be talking about convective cold pools and the implications for storm prediction. And so this is just a basic outline as to where I'm, I'm going to take the talk today. We're going to touch on what cold pools are in case you've never seen or don't know what these animals are. Then I'm going to provide five reasons for why I believe we should study cold pools. Um, I'm going to look at or dig into cold pool processes a little more, those processes that generate and or dissipate cold pools. And then I'm going to finally touch up on some of the issues that we face when modeling cold pools and the implications of this for the prediction of storms. Okay, so let's start out with what cold pools are. And as I say, if you've never seen these animals, they're simply defined to be a region or pool of relatively cold air surrounded by warmer air. So they are evaporatively generated, and the schematic on the right here shows this. This is the base of a storm. Warm, moist environmental air um, flows in through the base of the storm, and then once we form precipitation drops and these evaporate, so that air becomes negatively buoyant, sinks to the surface, and then spreads out as a density current spreads out laterally under the storm system. And then the edges of these cold pools or density currents are referred to as gust fronts. 
and these loft or assist in lofting warm, moist air up into the storm system. So they're negatively buoyant, they're really dense, cold regions of air, and in essence, they take on density current physics. So this same process is on the go when you pour cold, dense milk into your coffee cup in the morning, that cold, dense milk sinks to the base of the cup and spreads out laterally in a rather turbulent manner. And this animation I really like, this is of a storm developing over the um, Carolina coast. You can see this convective storm developing, and then you can see in the lower levels, the signature arc as the cold pool develops and moves away from its parent storm. Now, when these cold pools, which this, the outward flow along the surface in association with cold pools can be really fast, the wind velocities can be very high. And when they flow, flow over um, surfaces that may be dusty or devoid of vegetation, they can pick up large amounts of, of dust particles and form haboobs, such as shown in this image on the bottom right. And haboobs then are just dusty cold pools, and we will touch a bit on those today as well. Okay, so some basic cold pool characteristics. You may wonder how cold cold pools are. In the sense, they range from about 1 Kelvin or 1 degree C to 15 degrees C cooler than their environments. They can be 100 meters all the way through to 5 kilometers deep. If you look in the literature to get some sense of their depths. They can live on order of 1 hour to a, a, on order of 1 day. And they can actually cover large distances. So short distances and then around 10 kilometers all the way through order several thousand kilometers as demonstrated by this um, sort of series of satellite images here. So this storm in this top left image developed up in um, Iraq and you can see the outflow boundary or the edge of the cold pool moving away from the storm. And through the nighttime hours, it moves, it continues to move over the Arabian Peninsula all the way through to the following morning. And you can see by virtue of these series of, of um, satellite images that this, this um, cold pool has covered several of the countries within the Arabian Peninsula. So they can travel for long distances and they can live throughout daytime and nighttime hours and as such can take on a nocturnal um, time scales. All right, so now let's let me um, try to persuade you. I'm going to give you five reasons for why we really should care about cold pools. And so the first reason is they're very common, right? You find them in most places on Earth from very moist tropical maritime regions all the way through to the driest um, deserts on the planet. They also play a fundamental role in cloud systems. And so the first critical thing that they do is they're very important to storm initiation. And so these two satellite, uh, excuse me, radar images, which were obtained during NASA's crystal face field campaign over the Floridian Peninsula, you can see several storms developing in this image on the left, and you can see these signature arcs um, or uh, signifying the edges of the cold pools produced by these two storm systems. And then half an hour later, you can see in this image on the right, new storms going up along those gas front boundaries or those cold pool um, edges. So they play a really important role in initiating or developing new convection. Now you may say, how important is this really? And I dug into the literature actually to find out some of these answers. And in this study by Lima and Wilson conducted a number of years ago, they were looking at a large database of moist tropical environments. And from their analysis, they found that more, more than half of the storms in this database were initiated by cold pools. So this is some indication that cold pools are really important in storm initiation. They also play a really important role in the intensity as well as the propagation and the longevity of storm systems. And so if you have a look at this image here on the right, you can see this deep storm developing. You can see at the surface, this cold pool of air, the edge of the cold pool or the gust front. And you can see that the, the um, dynamics of the cold pool and the gust front are such that you lift this warm, moist environmental air up into the storm system. And if we take a cross section through that, as shown in this image, again, you can see our storm system. You can see the cold pool in the surface here, and you can see it assisting this, this warm, positively buoyant 
um, environmental air to be ingested into the storm. However, if something changes the intensity of the cold pool, makes it more dense perhaps, it can actually flow away from its storm so it can get out ahead of its storm. And then under these scenarios, this, this um, moist environmental air now misses its mark, right? It's no longer ingested by the storm system. And so the cold pools actually dictate that quite strongly. And under this scenario then, as seen in this image down in the bottom left, I hope that you can see the edges of the cold pools here, and they've actually got out ahead of their thunderstorms, right? So they've actually flowed out ahead of the thunderstorms. And under this scenario, these storms collapsed soon after this gust front moved away from its storm. And so you can see the important role that cold pools play in supporting their storms, in keeping them long lived, in assisting in their propagation. And when, when cold pools or their gust fronts get out ahead of their storm systems, we refer to the storm system as have been, having been gusted out, right? The gust fronts got out ahead of the storm and the storm collapses. Cold pools also play an important role in the organization of convective storm systems. And we demonstrated this recently in a paper published in GRL. Um, in this image here, this is actually of a really large domain. You can see all sorts of different convector systems developing over a tropical maritime area. And under these scenarios, the cold pools were on. It was a regular simulation. And then we ran some tests where we turned the cold pools off. How did we do this? We turned off evaporation below cloud base. And you can see that as a result of turning the cold pools off, there are the orientation of the convector systems to the wind shear, their organization, their clumping, and so on, was vastly different than under this scenario when cold pools were turned on or allowed to be on. So cold pools play an important role then in the organization of convection. All right, another important area that cold pools play a role is in impacting surface fluxes. So what's shown here is actually an image from a very high resolution um, numerical model simulation. We've removed the storm system producing this cold pool and all you're looking at here is an isosurface of virtual potential temperature. The cold pool is moving um, away from its center, right? So it's moving in both directions as indicated by my mouse here. And then what's shown in the shading here are surface sensible heat fluxes, where the grayer is um, lower sensible heat fluxes, and then the orange is higher sensible heat fluxes. And so you can see from this image that in the, in the gust front, this region of great turbulence and rapid outflow velocities, that the sensible heat fluxes actually become very large in this region. You can also see how cold pools may impact latent heat fluxes. This comes from some simulations I did a number of years ago. And what you're looking at here is you're looking down on convector storms in a tropical maritime region. And the shading is actually water vapor where the darker colors are lower amounts of water vapor. And you can see that in these tropical cold pools then that they are associated with much drier regions than their surrounding environments. And as a result of being, being um, placing dry air over a moist um, oceanic boundary, you will enhance latent heat fluxes. So cold pools impact both sensible and latent heat fluxes from the surface. And when you have lots of them, as in a region here shown on the right, you could imagine this having quite a significant impact on that surface energy budget. Cold pools also play an important role in hazardous weather. So they um, often interfere with aviation, micro or, or downbursts are in essence an intense form of cold pools and a number of aviation accidents have been associated with such uh, microbursts and their associated cold pools. Um, cold pools have also been shown to play a really important role as indicated by this middle figure as to whether or not um, supercells produce tornadoes or they don't produce tornadoes. So uh, Markowski and Richardson um, went, Markowski and Richardson demonstrated this in this, in this um, paper here. And as I say, depending on whether the cold pool was more or less intense, so they found that the storms were more likely or less likely to produce tornadoes. And then finally down here on the right, 
Um, these haboobs, as we touched on earlier, or these dust carrying cold pools are actually quite a threat to air quality and human safety and are actually currently considered one of the most underrated weather hazards. And so cold pools again play a significant role in the generation of hazardous weather. And then the, finally, the fifth, um, fifth reason to really care about cold pools is they play an important role in the transport of dust, pollen, and other aerosols. And so this really beautiful image from the International Space Station shows some storms developing up here in sort of the left portions of this figure. And then you can see in the lower portions of this figure two enormous haboobs, right? You can see the new storms being initiated along their edges, and you can see a lot of dust being kicked up in these haboobs. So um, we know that dust uh, plays a really important role in terms of the planet. We know that it's an important fertilizer, both in maritime and continental regions. And we know that the Sahara, for example, is a really important source of dust. And so these haboobs or these dust laden cold pools Turns out they are really important regional source of dust. And how important then are they? A number of papers, as those shown down here, have shown that convective dust storms and their associated cold pools actually contribute to more than 60% of the dust budget in the Sahel and the Saharan regions. So once again, haboobs and all cold pools play an important role um, in, these, in these transport budgets. They also, not only do they transport dust, but they also transport pollen. And this is now becoming a really interesting area of research. In essence, if you look at this schematic shown here, precipitation produced by the parent storm will moisten the lower levels of the environment in addition to generating the cold pool. And as such, this moisture um, results in various pollen grains taking on the moisture swelling and then bursting and giving rise to lots of different spores and or smaller um, biogenics. And then these get transported outwards away from the storm in these winds of the cold pool. They can also, it turns out, be lofted back up into the storm systems where they actually serve um, rather effectively as ice nucleating particles. And it, some recent, there's actually been um, a fair amount of research now going into the implications of this transport of pollen by cold pools, um, and it travels in under this name thunderstorm asthma. So a number of events actually have been observed in Australia recently. This image here is from an event observed in 2016. As a result of this cold pool transporting pollen um, rapidly throughout Melbourne, at least nine people died and thousands of patients sought medical care for respiratory diseases. And you can see in this image here, this is a time series of the wind speed. And I've circled here the time period when the, when the gust front um, was um, um, traveling out at its fastest velocities. And this was the time period that coincided um, with these um, threats to human health. So cold pools, as I said, play an important role, not only in the transport of dust, but also in pollen, and these pose some serious human, human health um, threats to human health. All right, so hopefully I've convinced you that we do need to care about cold pools. And I'm now going to turn my attention to um, cold pool processes. And I'm going to focus on several different processes. So there are a number of different processes that can impact cold pools. And I'm going to give an example from each of these sort of four categories. And so I'm going to start out with microphysical and aerosol properties and combine that with environmental properties. And let's have a look at how these might impact the, these cold pools produced by storms. Okay, so as you may recall, we stated up front that cold pools are evaporatively generated. And so any process then that might change raindrop size distributions will impact cold pool intensities. And so let's think about that. If we have a population of raindrops and we are able to um, change that population to be comprised of a population of lots of little drops with the same amount of liquid water, then that population of lots of little drops will evaporate more efficiently because evaporation is a surface process. So by taking that population and changing it to lots of little drops, so you will expose more surface area of the drops and evaporation will become more efficient. 
And we were actually able to investigate this um, going back to this crystal face field campaign um, that was held over the Floridian Peninsula during 2002. During that field campaign, we saw lots of different coal pools um, developing in association with convection. And during the first half of the campaign, um, the air was relatively dust free. And then in the second half of the campaign, we had this influx of Saharan dust. And so we were able to run a suite of high resolution cloud resolving model simulations uh, in order to look at the impacts of dust on the coal pools developing during this field campaign. And so what I'm showing here on the left is just one example. What we did was we simulated different case studies and all we did was change the amount of dust available to the storms um, during those case studies. So in the left column here is our, um, our low dust scenario for one of these case studies. And in the right column here is our high dust scenario. Time moves from top to bottom. And the shading here is the surface temperature. The black lines indicate the gust fronts. And then these sort of pink lines are your storms. Now, remember, when you want to have long lived intense storms, we want to keep our storms closely linked to our gust front. We don't want to allow for it to gust out. So let's see what happens in the low dust scenario. And I should point out, this is the western edge of the peninsula. So in the low dust scenario, we see we have these really intense cold pools developing in association with the storm. But as you move forward in time, we see here in the second panel, the gas run starts to move away from its storm system shown here in pink. And then half, this is actually only even 15 minutes later, the storm is now completely collapsed as the gust run moved out ahead of its parent. And so this storm gusted out um, and it subsequently develops much later on. In the high dust scenario, we see right, the same development of storms, but the cold pools produced are actually a lot warmer. The gust front, if we look, um, this is an hour later, is still connected with its storm systems here. If we look another 15 minutes later, the storms are still connected with its outflow boundary. And this is as a result, stays as a long lived, well sustained storm. And so if we look at the physics that are on the go here, in the top, this is our low dust case. And in this scenario, we see uh, under the scenario of low dust loading, we actually end up with a raindrop population of lots of little drops, lots of little raindrops. And as a result of this, the evaporation is enhanced. The cold pool is really cold. And as we said, it gusts out, right? It gets away from its parent storm shown here in the middle. And so that storm collapses because it no longer receives this influx of warm, moist air. And then the storms do go later on to form um, later on in the simulation. In the high dose case, we have this population of fewer but much larger raindrops. The evaporation is less efficient, and so the cold pool is relatively warm compared to our low dust case. And as a result, this cold pool doesn't, it's less dense, so it doesn't get away from its parent storm. It stays nice and close to it, and so the storm is a long-lived self-sustained storm system. And if you look then at the precipitation produced, in the clean case, initially it produces precipitation, the storm decays because it gusts out, and then it strengthens later on. Whereas in the high dust scenarios, the storm is, is balanced, it's long lived, and it continues to produce precipitation. Okay, whoops, I managed to get ahead of one. Okay, so that was looking at the impacts of aerosols on cold pools. What about the impacts of cold pools on aerosols? And we were able to look at this recently in NASA's CAMPEX field campaign. We, were, we observed actually a number of cold pools during that campaign, which was held over the Philippines in September and October of 2019. Shown in this image here is the edge or the outflow boundary of this beautiful cold pool observed during one of our flights, Science Flight 7. And if we look at this then in a little more detail, I happen to be the flight scientist on this flight, and you can see um, the, the gas front in the far distance. And then here's, um, you can see this new convection being initiated as we flew over the gas front. This is from the belly camera of the plane shown in the bottom left. And if we look at the evolution in the top right of the storm system, you can see the cold pool that it develops and that flows away from, from its parent storm. 
And so we were able to examine this cold pool. We and I'm showing here on the bottom left the flight tracks over the cold pool that we made in the P3. And we were able to drop some drop sons both within and outside of the cold pool. And during this flight over the cold pool and out into the environment, we were also able to get some HSRL data, which provided us information then about the aerosol loading within the atmosphere. And so I marked here the, the um, time periods of when the drop song was released here, drop song six, and when the drop song was released here, drop song seven. So it gives you an indication as to where we see the cold pool in this vertical cross section showing the aerosol backscatter. And so I've marked on here the presence of the cold pool, and you can see that within the cold pool itself, this was really very clean air that we found within the cold pool boundaries. So in here, in this um, figure on the left, the air within the cold pool was very clean. And then as the cold pool surges out, it lifts this air with much higher aerosol loading that you can see here in the environment up and over the cold pool boundary. And as a result of that, it allows these aerosols to be activated and we can form new clouds in and along that um, cold pool boundary. So cold pool boundaries playing a really important role in lofting aerosols and activating new, new cloud systems. We were also able to look at the role of the environment on these Campex cold pools because we, being out of the ocean, we had the luxury of actually flying right down in through these cold pool systems. And so when you look at how cold pools develop and propagate, I've got a simple schematic, an animated schematic here on the right, and it shows um, a cold pool moving out towards the right, and you will see that you get these Kelvin Helmholtz waves developing in and along the edges of the cold pool that entrain environmental air into these cold pool systems. And we were actually able to observe that during um, during Campex. This is for the same um, the same cold pool that I was showing you earlier. Um, the blue lines here are the altitude of the airplane. So you can see we flew down right across the surface through the cold pool and then flew out of it. The red lines are actually carbon monoxide in parts per billion. And then the, the black lines are the free tropospheric entrained air. And through various approaches, and I don't have time to dig into the details of that now, but by virtue of being able to infer information from the gradients in carbon monoxide, we were able to determine that when we sampled this cold pool by flying through it, that it already had on average, it was already comprised of on average about 50% of free tropospheric air. So it was already a fairly mature cold pool. And then by virtue of being able to infer information from water saturation and the temperature profile, we were able to work out that the altitudes of which this free tropospheric air originated from were on the order of 1.5 to 3 kilometers above these cold pools. Now, in the tropics, when you, you, and we saw this quite a lot in the field campaign, you sometimes get these dry layers. If you have dry layers above the cold pools and you ingest those into the cold pools, this will impact how rapidly the cold pool, in essence, mixes out. Okay, so those were those two lots of processes. Let's look and think a little bit more about radiation interactions. And I'm going to discuss this in the framework actually of the boobs. So we've already touched on her boobs and stated that they are important regional sources of dust, right? That they're able to travel long distances. This is another example demonstrating her boob traveling over several countries in um, Northern Africa that they are a severe weather threat and that they we can expect them to likely intensify with climate change by virtue of um, land surfaces drying out and more dust being available um, for transport. And so when you look as shown in this top left image at these walls of dust being transported around by cold pools, one has to wonder whether or not radiation interactions with dust will actually impact the intensity of the cold pool. We know that dust scatters incoming shortwave radiation. We know that dust also absorbs incoming shortwave radiation and then also absorbs longwave radiation and will re-emit it to the atmosphere. And so we set about trying to determine whether the interactions of radiation with the dust in these haboobs made a difference. And so this is some work I did with my PhD student, Jenny Bukowski. She has just recently graduated. 
And what we did was um, simulated a number of different case studies using Wolf Chem um, within the Arabian Peninsula. And so what's shown up here in the top left is one of these linear intense convective systems. So this is um, simulated radar reflectivity. You can see it's a very long lived um, linear mesoscale convective system. And then on the right here, this is the surface dust that, that's being lofted off the surface. And you can see all these little circular regions. These are the footprints of the cold pools developing in association with this intense mesoscale convective system. And so what we were able to do was to conduct simulations of these long lived haboobs. And the beauty of models, of course, was that we could conduct the simulations with radiation on. And then we could conduct exactly the same simulations, but turned off the interactions between radiation and dust. And so that's what we did. Given, as you can see from these animations, that lots of different cold pools were produced, we made use of a cold pool tracking algorithm. And then from that, we produced lots of these histograms, these normalized histograms, for when radiation and dust were allowed to interact, shown in the red, and then when radiation and dust were not allowed to interact. Now, as I started out up front, remember these long lived cold pools, they can, they can exist throughout an entire diurnal cycle. And so we had to split our analysis into daytime hours, into what we call the evening hours, and then into nighttime hours. Um, in daytime hours, clearly we had short wave and long wave responses. In the evening hours, um, the short wave incoming short wave is much less, and then during the nighttime hours, clearly we only have long wave radiation. And so, in the interest of time, I can't go through all the analysis, but I do want to talk to the schematic um, that we produced. This paper's actually just come out in press and JGR if you want to dig into the details. But in essence, let's see what goes on in these in these cold pools. So here's our storm system producing our precipitation that evaporates and then produces our cold pool that flows away from it. And as it flows away from it, right, it picks up dust. And so there's a number of things that we expect to happen then. Incoming shortwave radiation should be scattered by the dust and absorbed by the dust. Um, you should get long wave um, 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 absorption and re-emission by the presence of dust. And then depending on the dominant signal here, right, depending on whether it's a scattering or an absorption and re-emission signal, so this depends on whether or not we would heat or cool the cold pool. And I'll show you what the model showed us in a moment in terms of this. So if the scattering effect dominates, we should cool the cold pool. If the absorption effect dominates, we should warm the cold pool. Of course, when you heat cold pools, remember these are density currents. So if you heat them, you weaken them because they become less dense. If you cool them, you intensify them so they become more dense. Um, as a result of these changes to the heating um, or cooling of the atmosphere, this will impact um, the surface fluxes into our cold pool, because remember surface fluxes are dependent on the gradient of the temperature between the cold pool and the surface. And then also if we're heating or cooling, cooling the cold pool, this will impact the wind speed, those outflow wind speeds, because more intense cold pools should flow out more rapidly. It will also talk to the turbulence and then, of course, the wind speed and the turbulence will then determine how much dust keeps on being picked up by the cold pool. So this was sort of our working idea in terms of the processes involved. And now the trick is what did Wharf Chem actually demonstrate in terms of these simulated cold pools? Remember, there were lots in these simulations. You know, we looked at these in a normalized sense, so we could compare all the cold pools we saw in this in this situation. So in our daytime hours, these are hours which we had high um, incoming short wave as well as um, long wave responses. The model does indeed show that the short wave scattering impact um, or the short wave scattering processes dominate. And as a result of that, we see that the cold pool temperatures drop. And with these dropping in the cold pool temperatures, the wind speeds um, are enhanced because the cold pool is more intense and so will flow faster away from its parent storm. And then with those enhanced wind speeds, so we see enhanced dust being picked up from the surface. In the evening hours then, now remember our short wave, our incoming short wave has dropped off. 
And during these hours, the model indicates that a long wave absorption is dominating. As a result of that, the cold pools actually get warmer and so they weaken. And with warmer and weaker cold pools, the wind speeds drop, the model shows that they drop, and so we pick up less dust off the surface. So this all makes sense. Then we looked at our cold pools during the nighttime hours. During the nighttime hours, the long wave absorption dominates and the cold pool temperatures are found to increase, so the cold pools weaken. But the model indicates that the wind speeds actually increase and that more dust is picked up off the surface. And so what's actually on the go here during these nighttime hours? Because even though the cold pool is weaker, the wind speeds are stronger and more dust is picked up. And so if you have a look what's on the go here, in the daytime hours when we have our unstable environments, our cold pools propagate as a function um, of, of the temperature differences between it and the environment. However, at nighttime or into the early hours of the morning and particularly over the deserts, when you get the development of these lofted inversion layers by virtue of the cooling of the um, Earth's surface, cold pools that in the daytime scenario might look like this are now forced to flow in under this capping inversion, right? We've capped the atmosphere and forced these cold pools to flow in a shallower depth. And of course, as soon as you force fluids to flow in shallower depths, they will speed up. You know, think Bernoulli and back to um, sort of basic physics. If you take fluids in a pipe and you for force them to flow in a shallower depth, the fluids will speed up. So in the nighttime environment, even though we have a dominant long wave warming and weaker cold pools from a thermodynamic perspective, they do speed up because they're forced to flow in under this inversion layer. So the cold pool height is reduced, the speed increases, and there's less vertical dispersion of dust. And so you may say, well, that's, that's great. That all seems to work from a physical perspective. Is there, are there any observations to support this? Because these results come from a model. And no sooner had we submitted this paper for review, than we saw this paper by Harrison and co-authors coming out the University of Oxford. They've just done a whole lot of observational assessments of cold pools of the Sahara, and certainly found differences in their diagonal propagation speeds. And so this, this concept does seem to be supported both in terms of model physics and in terms of observational um, databases. Okay, so let's say, see where we are. We're now coming into our last um, um, sort of processes that can impact cold pools. And this now comes back to the land surface. And clearly cold pools are flowing along the land surface. So we should expect the land surface to have feedbacks or impacts um, on cold pool intensities and propagation. And so the first thing that we looked at actually was the impacts um, pertaining to sensible heat fluxes. This was some work I did several years ago now with my PhD student at that time, Leah Grant. And we were looking at the impacts of sensible heat fluxes on cold pools in the Sahara. So these are really dry um, regimes where we would expect the sensible heat flux to dominate perhaps of the latent heat fluxes. And in essence, we ran a suite of really high resolution um, cold pools, and we're assessing what role the sensible heat fluxes might play. And we found that the dissipation of cold pools occurred by two different mechanisms. The first was through direct heating. So if you place a really cold cold pool, a very warm desert surface, we are gonna get sensible heat fluxes into the cold pool that will warm it and result in its dissipation. The other way, however, that cold pools might be um, dissipated through action of the surface is by virtue of sensible heat fluxes warming the environment, and then that warm environmental air being entrained into these cold pool scenarios. And so we looked at these um, two different processes in a suite of idealized simulations um, of cold pools over desert environments. And we find some interesting um, scenarios. What's shown here in this um, panel is a vertical profile of our control simulation in which we didn't allow surface fluxes or turbulent fluxes. Then in the red line here is when we only allow um, the heating of the atmosphere to impact cold pools. 
And then in the blue line, we only allow these surface impacts on cold pools. And if you look at the differences, percentage differences shown in the right panel, these are differences from the control. Do note that warmer is on the left here because these are negative perturbations. So we see that the surface fluxes impact the cold pool. These cold pools are about two and a half kilometers deep. They tend to impact the lower one and a half to one kilometer of the cold pools, right? They will mix out or dissipate the cold pools in the lower levels. And then from the turbulent mixing of the environment, this will impact the cold pools in the upper levels. So by virtue of sensible heat fluxes, these two mechanisms are both at play, one impacting that um, interface between the surface and the cold pool, and the other impacting the environment, which then gets entrained into the cold pool. And both of these processes will then dissipate the cold pool. And um, this just shows an animation of a cold pool evolving over this interactive land surface. And we have to stop it just to just to change the scales to see it. And I'll allow it to play through again. But you'll see the cold pool moving in from the left when the animation starts again. And you will see here the cold pool mixing out from the base through the impact of the surface, as well as from these Kelvin Helmholtz that are entraining this warm environmental air into the cold pool and thereby dissipating it. Sensible heat fluxes are not the only things that impact cold pools. Certainly latent heat fluxes can too. And we've, in, we've investigated this again through high resolution LES simulations. And what we did was we ran um, these are very idealized simulations. We allow convection to develop. And in essence, we run the simulation over and over but for different amounts of soil moisture saturation fractions. And so we conducted suites of simulations over very damp soil, all the way through suites of simulations over very dry soil. And if you have a look then to see what impacts this might have on the cold pool, um, because there were so many cold pools in these simulations, again, we built composites. And what we did in compositing these cold pools is um, in essence, divided by the radius of the, the cold pools themselves. So we have in these cross sections that I'm showing here, we have the center of the cold pool in the center, and then at a radius of one, that represents the gust front, and then beyond a radius of one, you are in the environment. And so we looked at a number of the different characteristics of the cold pool, from the intensity all the way through to the um, um, radial wind velocity. So let's look to see what impact soil moisture has on these cold pools. So remember here at radius zero, we are in the center of the cold pool. At radius one, we're at the gust front. And then beyond radius one, we're in the environment. And so looking at this top left um, panel here, we can see that cold pools in our drier soil environments are much more intense. They're much cooler than the environment compared to the wet soil environment shown in the greens and yellows. Their radial wind velocities are much stronger, as shown here in this panel in the top right. Um, and they actually have much stronger updrafts in and along their gas trunks. So this will play an important role in the initiation of new convection. And then finally, in, the internal um, water vapor contents in the drier soil environments tends to be greater than that of the surroundings. This is simply a relative comparison, right? Dry and moist um, environments. So take home from this, when you're in environments of much drier soil, the cold pools are more intense. As a result, their radial velocities are a lot larger. The gas front is flowing much faster. And so you are able to loft or, or um, lift air more rapidly in and along the gas front. Now, in looking at this, you may say, hold on a moment, what's going on here? There seem to be sort of two regimes, a moist soil regime and a dry regime with nothing in between, and you would be right to state that. So in looking at this a little more, and it's, it's interesting in the sense that the really moist regime sit here, the really dry regime sit here, but this yellow line the soil saturation is 50%, and this sort of tan line, the soil saturation is only 45%. These seem to be really close. Why are the differences then in the cold pool intensities or these temperature perturbations, why are they so different? And this actually comes down to this um, characteristic of plants called the permanent wilting point. 
And what this is, is that as soon as the soil moisture, this threshold in soil moisture is reached, if, it, if the soil moisture drops below that threshold, plants are no longer able to draw any water out of the soil and in essence, um, release it to the atmosphere through their stomata. So in the interest of self-preservation, when the water in the soil drops below that level, the stomata will close. And so that shuts down this whole evapotranspiration process. And it turns out that for this soil used in these um, uh, model resolutions, the permanent wilting point for the soil lies right between 45 and 50. And so as soon as you get into these soil saturation numbers below that permanent wilting point, the stomata close and you can no longer flux water vapor to the environment. So lots of things to consider here in terms of soil moisture, the role played by plants and the feedbacks to cold pools. Okay, so now just to wrap this up as we come into the last few slides, what implications does all of what I've shown you today have for modeling cold pools and hence for the predictions of storms? So firstly, hopefully I've convinced you that cold pools are critical from five different points of view. They're ubiquitous, they're important to storm initiation, organization, longevity, and propagation speeds. They're significant feedbacks between land surfaces and cold pools. They produce hazardous weather, and they play this important role in the transport of dust, pollen, and other biogenics. And so as we think about the next decade and modeling considerations for the next decade, we know, and the community is pretty much on board, that within the next 10 years, we will be seeing, and it's already um, on the go, global mesoscale models with horizontal grid spacings on the order of a kilometer. And so as a result of that, we will be resolving thunderstorms and cold pool motions globally and capturing microphysical, dynamical aerosol and radiation feedbacks. And so we have to ask ourselves, are our parameterizations appropriate? Um, are they accurate? How well are we representing the future as we move into these global cloud resolving models? And then also as we move into changing climates where we know that, that certainly in some regions, air will be warmer, soils will be drier, right? As we move into these changing climates, we will need to enhance our forecasting capabilities of severe and extreme weather events and their feedbacks to the climate system. And so there's, five, there's really sort of five things we need to consider. I showed you that cold pools are evaporatively generated and that their intensity is impacted by aerosols and the environment. And so as we move forward into this next decade, we really need to strive to enhance our representation of the microphysical and dynamical interactions in storms, as well as ensure that we are initiating, initiating our environment with appropriate or accurate environmental conditions, including aerosol loading. We really need to be striving to utilize fully interactive or two-way land surface parameterizations. I demonstrated to you how sensitive cold pool characteristics can be to the land surface representation. In the study we did two years ago, we looked at cold pool characteristics when using an interactive land surface shown here on the left and a non-interactive land surface shown here on the right. These are just Hobmoller plots. So this is time moving from bottom to top. And this is the temperature perturbations from the environment where darker is cooler. And you can see when we were not using an interactive land surface parameterization, this cold pool intensity is actually 30% more intense. It's about 60% wider and it lives for twice as long. So if we're not making proper use of our representation of our land surfaces, we are not going to capture cold pool processes appropriately. We also need to ensure that we enhance our representation of land surface properties correctly, particularly soil moisture, our sensible heat fluxes, and other things like vegetation type, soil type, and, and our representation of sea surface temperatures. We need to ensure that we enhance and continue to strive to do our best with aerosol parameterizations, particularly those pertaining to dust, pollen, which is a whole new area of research and other aerosol parameterizations, in particular, how they are emitted off the surface. We know that this feeds back to cold pool intensities and that it has important um, health impacts. We also need to take into consideration the grid spacing that we use when simulating cold pools. We did some work again um, three or four years ago 
on the sensitivity of cold pools to grid spacing. In these two figures here, the cold pool is moving from left to right. And the only difference in these simulations is the horizontal grid spacing. In the upper levels, in upper figure, it's 50 meters. In the bottom figure, it's 400 meters. And you can see great differences in the temperatures of the cold pools, their structure, the representation of the Kelvin Helmholtz waves, their depths, and even how fast they move. And we found from the study that we only get convergence of model solutions at grid spacings of 100 meters. That is devastating for those of you that work in numerical weather prediction. It's really difficult to be getting down to grid spacings of 100 meters. But this is, you know, these are future goals to think about and aim for. The other question you may ask, is this really the case? Uh, do observations actually justify this? And that's a really good question. And so we do need to think as we move into the next decade of obtaining appropriate cold pool observations. They're very challenging to observe. If you thought, well, maybe I'll go about observing cold pools from space fleets platforms using remote sensing. Remember, they are typically very shallow features. They are often quite clear and they are often of fairly similar temperatures to the surface. All of that's pretty challenging when you consider space based platforms. If you wanted to measure these from the surface, such as surface based radars or radio sounds, that's a great approach. But cold pools can be several kilometers deep. And so your uh, surface based instruments will not reach them. Planes, it's pretty dangerous to fly through these systems. They're turbulent and they're shallow. And remember, they're fast moving quite often. So your platforms need to be mobile. And then they're highly heterogeneous. And so on my last slide here, and this is just for people to think about, we've been trying to design some novel approaches to make measurements of cold pools. We conducted a field campaign in the last couple of years, and we've just um, published the results in BAMS on this, where we've really been trying to go after making measurements of spatial and temporal heterogeneities in cold pools, just of the base state quantities, temperature, pressure, winds, moisture, and so on. And so we've been flying these walls or what we call flying curtains um, in, in, um, in, we place them, we fix ourselves uh, in a fixed location to the ground. We get out ahead of the cold pool. We measure the environment. We allow the cold pool to come through these flying curtains. And then we measure the gas front as well as the characteristics within the cold pools. And I'm not going to dig into this. If you want to, please feel free to read the article, but the take home from this is that by virtue of the measurements we've made in the cold pools that have been on order of 100 meters apart, we see sensitivity or changes um, as a function of only being 100 meters apart in the temperature fields particularly. So it suggests that there is heterogeneity on scales of 100 meters and that we need to consider this as we move forward with our models. And so, John, if there is time, I know online it sometimes goes a little slower, so I'm a little late here, but if there is time, I'm really willing to take questions and have discussions. So thanks very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Vandenheber. So if anyone has any questions with this new um, format, you can actually unmute yourself to ask your question. Or if you do not have a microphone, you can just go ahead and type in the chat as always. Hi. Uh, uh, Dr. Lee, I see you're unmuted. Yeah, this is my wife's nice time. Um, I was wondering if you looked up the PECAN or uh, IHOP on pools. There were several remote sensor networks that were uh, that would give you temperature and moisture, and some have different fluxes. Yeah, that's a that's a great question, and we did look into PECAN to to get observations um, of the cold pools made during that campaign. And in fact, a number of the people participating in PECAN actually were also involved in this CAMPEX field campaign. Um, one of the um, differences in the CAMPEX field campaign was that we lined, you know, we built this wall of observations or this, what we call this flying curtain, and we ensured that the spacing between the observations was on the order of 100 meters. So we were able to get this continuous sampling of these passages of cold pools at spacings, observational spacings um, of 100 meters. And that wasn't unfortunately available in Picard. Many other great um, observations were, but that one wasn't. And so 
um, in this campaign, we were specifically after that, you know, to see whether or not um, our model predictions of convergence at 100 meters was necessary. And the, the observations in these in these cold pools that observed, we got we caught 16 or 17 different cold pools, and they all show these same scenarios that the temperature varies on spatial scales of 100 meters. So it suggests. Um, that the model grid spacing and convergence is 100 meters uh, may be correct. But as you say, we're now looking into all sorts of other campaigns to see, including PECON, to see what data um, we can scour from those, those campaigns. So thank you. That's a really great question. There was also a question in the chat from Anil Kumar. Um, Anil, you can unmute yourself. If you want to ask that question. Yeah, you know, I just wanted to ask you, uh, you know, different land surface models like NOVA or other uh, models, uh, what is the sensitivity in capturing this cold process? Because they all are, uh, you know, they have a different land physics processes. So is there any way to, uh, you know, it's very important to predict cold pool to understand this land surface model itself, how they are behaving. So is there anything, uh, any, anything from that? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a really good question. And as you um, very correctly point out, different land surface schemes, uh, you know, they, they range from being really simple to really sophisticated and complex. And um, we've actually started digging into that now. We've been doing experiments with WARF and the different land surface schemes represented in WARF. We're doing the same thing with RAMS as well and looking at um, those different interactions as a function of um, land surface sophistication. So I guess my short answer to that and rather an unsatisfactory answer is yes, we're working on it and we still um, don't yet have a sense of the ranges in responses. But what we do know is that if you don't have a fully interactive land surface where you can capture the impacts of the cold pool on the land and then the impacts of the land back on the atmosphere we do know that those um, cold pools, when um, simulating case studies of this effect, they are not nearly as well captured. They tend to be too long lived. They tend to be um, too intense because you know they're not interacting and dissipating as a result of, of their interactions with the land surface. So that's what we know up until now. And we have a lot more work um, actually to do in this regard. Yeah, actually, with, with my experience of working with the land surface model, let's say NOAA, the energy partition is very difficult, yeah. uh, sensible and latent, and uh, it's very difficult and model still having facing these challenges. And your cold pool, I mean, you explained it, how this sensible heat and latent heat flux are so important to really organize this cold pool. Yeah, I mean, and that's, a, I mean, when, we, when we're doing it in the sort of research mode, we have the luxury of isolating them and looking at sensible heat, like if we're looking over desert areas or um, latent heat separately, you know, we have that luxury. But when we're running forecast models, when, as you say, the partitioning between latent heat and sensible heat, that's such a, such a sensitive thing in itself. And then we have to get that right in our land surface scenarios in order to, you know, to capture those impacts on cold pools uh, yeah, there's a lot of work to be done there. A lot of a lot of job security. We've still got a still got a lot more work to be done in that regard. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I also see two hands raised. Um, one Jian Yu Zhang and then Santiago Santiago Gusso. Um, either of you can go ahead and unmute them to yourselves. I think Santiago, you're actually already unmuted. Yes. Yes. Uh, I have two related questions. One is uh, oh, by the way, I really enjoy your talk. Very nice, very informative. Uh, yeah, um, regarding the interactions between dust and the cold uh, cool poles, you mentioned uh, a feedback process through a radiative process. I wonder if the when you have a haboob forming and you have the dust lifting, is there any feedback process through the microphysics in the sense that, you know of dust going into? And and the other, the second question is related. How can you comment? Uh, Cool pool, cool pool formation in an environment where is very thick, uh, high concentrations of smoke, like we had, you know, the big uh, in this last summer. You know, you could see that from space very well. Thank you. 
Thank you, Aga. Thank you for your for your kind comments and those great questions. Um, let me talk to the smoke one first because there was that extensive hububa. I think it's the one you're referring to um, of Arizona. They had all sorts of fires, and um, the smoke from those fires got um, entrained into that into that hububa. And there was also dust scenarios um, as some of the dust was swept up into there too. So that's an extremely complex scenario. We actually. It's interesting you raise that. We're right in the process of simulating that case study just because it was so intensive and so interesting and because it had smoke in it. Now, in training smoke into cold pools, if the if the haboob has smoke in it and it's not, <clears throat> you have to remember it's not covered by the parent storm anvils, right? That'll change the radiation interactions. But if it has smoke in it and it and it can see the clear sky. Um, I, I would fully expect for that smoke to be highly absorptive, both of, of short wave and then also of long wave radiation. And so I suspect that the presence of the smoke, and we'll see if the simulations bear this out, but I suspect that the presence of the smoke will weaken the cold pool from the point of view of that absorption and that warming uh, scenario. And so as soon as you make you know such density currents warmer, they weaker and don't flow as fast. So I suspect that's what will happen. But you know, we run we run simulations because we don't know the answers. And so we'll have to see what comes out of that. Um, in terms of the interactions um, with dust in cold pools and dust being entrained again into um into the storms producing them, yeah, that's that could be a very um interesting feedback. Because as you entrain dust into storms, that changes the raindrop size distribution. Um, it can also change ice crystal concentrations, you know, through all sorts of aerosol indirect effects. And so that would change um, evaporation and melting efficiencies and hence the strength of your cold pool. And um, the trick is, is how much of that dust that's being transported in the cold pool actually makes it back into the storm itself. So remember, cold pools are negatively buoyant, so that air doesn't actually want to rise. And it's actually quite difficult to get cold pool air back up into the storm system. If you're flowing over a region, though, where you are lofting some of the environmental air, you could get dust into the storm like that. But from the cold pool itself, it's more challenging. So some fascinating interactions, and I'm not sure we know all the answers to those things yet. So super question. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very good. Thank you. They actually have a lot of questions coming in, so we have a little bit of a queue. I hope that's okay. That's <laughs> Um, so, Jian Yu, um, you have your hands raised. Oh, yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yep, we can. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Haver, for the very informative talk. Uh, my question is about the the long wave absorption um, section from the interaction of dust and the cold pool. So, um, if I understand correctly, the long wave absorption in at nighttime increased the cold pool temperature and weakened the cold pool. But the wind speed is still increased because of the press of the temperature inversion layer. And at this time, if I understand it right, the nighttime dust layer height should also be lower than that in daytime, right? And is there any studies showing uh, using observations to show the diurnal difference of the dust layer height during the cold pool? Excellent question, Yanyu. And um, it's so very little observations have been made as a function of the nocturnal cycle of cold pools. The only observational study that we could find to date that um, demonstrated differences between day and night was that study that just came out this year from um, by Harrison and others, um, Richard Washington and others at the University of Oxford. What we don't have is um, at least to my knowledge, and I've scoured the literature for this, what we don't have as yet are nice cross sections. You know, you could do that with the radar potentially, and we've used radar in the field to look at the heights and depths of cold pools. We don't have nice observations of radars um, as a function. You know, you'd want to track the same cold pool so you could see a change in its height because cold pools are different heights. So you would want to track it through the nocturnal cycle using some ground based radar. And I don't know of any um, observations to that effect. And if anyone does, I would love to hear about it. Um, but yeah, you would need some setup like that to track that and to show 
you know, the models show it, but observationally, I haven't seen that yet. You would have to see this drop in the, in the, in the height of the cold pool. So great question and work, again, work to be done. Yeah. And is there any like statistical uh, results that have done before for, for the dual variation of the? No, pool? no, John, you're not as yet. This is really, it's really a sort of new area of research. Um, I've actually been talking a bit um, with Ping Yang from Texas A&M because he's interested in the dust side and that whole radiation. And, you know, we need to remember in, in models, we make assumptions regarding aerosol sizes, aerosol optical depths, you know, aerosol sh shapes and so on. So there's a lot of unknown in that scenario. So the short answer to your question, no, we need to go after statistics. We need to go after um, large observational databases, you know, to look into this. This this field campaign we recently did, this CampEx field campaign, we, were, we focused only on cold pools and we were excited to get full data sets of 16 different cold pools in the field. We do have radar associated with that, and we're now analyzing all of those. But I do not know of other databases that have been statistically assessed in this way. I see. Thank you. Thank you. John Gil Han also messaged me a text question. Um, so if John Gil, if you want to unmute yourself, you are free to. I'll give you a second. Okay, I can also read their question because um, they did just text me the whole thing. So, any idea to include cold pool parameterization in a cumulus convection scheme for about 10 kilometers global model? Yeah, that's that's the that's the golden question, right? Young, you know, it's hard. It's really challenging, and it's challenging. Why? Because as hopefully you saw from the talk today, cold pools involve so many different scales, right? So they involve um, the storm scale, they involve radiation, they involve the land surface and so on. And in our, in our mesoscale models, we demonstrated we really need to get down to grid spacings of 100 meters. So when we're in global models, we need to think about different ways to do this. And some work has actually recently been done on this. Um, a couple of different groups are looking at this. In particular, um, out of Munich, the University of Munich, um, Miriam um, Hurt um, and George Craig have been doing some work on cold pool parameterizations um, for global models. Um, and there's also been some, some work done here. I know Tony Del Genio, before he retired, had started some of that work. I'm not sure um, whether they, you know, whether his group is carrying on with that. But there are certainly people looking into ways in which to represent um, the impacts of cold pools in, in GCMs, you know, these 10 kilometer scale GCMs, in particular when it comes to convective initiation. So that's really the big kicker. So yes, work is being done in the community on that. A very challenging problem because they're impacted by so many different processes, but work is on the go in this regard. Yeah. Thank you. We also have a question from CU Sean, and that is the end of my queue. So CU, you can unmute yourself. Uh, yes. Yeah. Hi. Uh, hi, Sam. Uh, hi, Sue. Thanks for your talk. And uh, it's quite interesting. And I'm wondering, uh, it, I have a very uh, easy question. Uh, how do you quantify the cold, uh, cold pool strength? I remember you mentioned that the, like the cold pools uh, or uh, moisture soil is like several times stronger than the uh, on that on the dry soil. So I'm wondering how do you quantify strength, especially when you want to uh, uh, like quantify its influence uh, or like convection or some other uh, weather system? Thank you. Yeah, I see you. Thank you for that question. The, so the strength of the cold pool can be quantified in a number of different ways. Normally just by the, normally the most basic measurement is um, a perturbation in some thermodynamic variable from the environment. So normally what we would use is density potential temperature. And I'm not, you know, hopefully you're familiar with that, but any thermodynamic variable, we like density potential temperature because it includes the impacts um, of particles as well as, as the sort of thermodynamic elements. So really what we're looking for 
is thermodynamic differences between the cold pool and the environment. And when those numbers, the larger that number becomes, i.e. the colder the pool, um, the more intense it's assumed to be because it is a density current and it's so it flows as a function of its density. And so in the dry versus the uh, moist soil moisture scenarios, we actually find that cold pools are quite a lot uh, more um, intense actually in drier environments as it happens compared to moist environments. But we must remember this is specific to different environments. So that's over land in the tropics. And if you dry out that soil, the cold pools become more intense in part because drier soil ends up with drier boundary layers. And so you can evaporate precipitation more readily. And as soon as we evaporate, we make you know the, the air forming into the cold pool denser and colder. So it actually comes back to the impacts of the soil moisture on the environment that then dictates how efficient the evaporation process is. So in short, intensity is really just a differentiator in terms of the temperature of the cold pool versus its environment. And in drier environments um, where you can enhance the evaporation, you can make those cold pools colder. Thank you. That is it for my queue. If anyone has any questions, they can just go ahead and unmute themselves and ask it. Give people like five seconds to do that. Oh, somebody did it. Hi, uh, Dr. Hibbert. Yeah, this is Jan Yu again. I actually have one more question. Oh, so, based on my understanding, um, from the plot you show for uh, dust aerosols impact on the cold pool events. So you're showing like um, the dust um, will enhance the or maybe enlarge the droplet size and weaken the cold pool, while less dust will give stronger cold pool and then gets out to have a diurnal precipitation patterns. And based on my understanding, I know like. Dust particle, especially pure dust, is actually a good ice nuclear, but not like a CCN. And I'm wondering, um, is your study suggesting that the transported dust would be a good CCN rather than a good ice nuclear, the IN, so that you can uh, have the reduce the range of size and then weaken the cold pool? So I knew that's a that's a fantastic question, actually. And at the time that we started these simulations during Crystal Face, that was one of the big questions of interest um, as to whether or not dust could serve as both a CCN and an ice nucleating particle. And then more work has been done then um, since um, off the coasts, actually off the coasts of West Africa. You know, there was the Namafiel campaign held out there. And there's been observations also um, within the Caribbean to look into these impacts. And people like Cindy Tui and Paul DeMart, who have done a lot of work in the areas of, of ice nucleating particles and CCN, have found actually that dust can serve as both. It can serve both as a CCN and as an ice nucleating particle. So you're right, initially the community was really much focused on dust serving as a very effective and efficient ice nucleating particle. But it turns out that they can actually also serve as CCN. And so those the impacts of dust um, being able to serve as both is actually incorporated in these simulations. And it's through both of those processes, warm rain processes and ice processes, that you end up in the shift um, in the in the raindrop size distributions at the surface. So excellent question. Um, and yeah, uh, you know. As I say, recent studies and it's and these have coming out in the literature now um, do do show that dust can serve as both. So thank you. See. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, I, I assume that we are finished with questions. I don't see anyone else in the muting. Um, and thank you, um, Dr. Vandenheber, for this great talk. I think everyone really loved it. I was very engaged. Um, and thank you everyone for attending. And if anyone has any feedback about this new seminar set, um, please just go ahead and email John or I. Um, but I will see you all next week. Have a good day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Professor.
okay. I keep that the last person. <laughs> <laughs> They weren't, they weren't leaving fast enough. Okay. I think, I think that went really well. I just, uh, I, I, that was like a lot of questions. So it was kind of hard to organize because I, I was seeing like some people were unmuting themselves, but like there were more questions in front of them. So that was kind of hard. I don't know if there's a better way that we can do it. Okay. Um, so that, I think then, then, and kind of show them uh, this new format is better. <laughs> yeah, I I think so. I think so. I mean, that's gonna that's gonna be a problem. I mean, even in our old format, that's 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 a problem. And I just have to kind of remember the order. It's just a little hard when when everyone can unmute themselves. They're like, okay, like I'm gonna ask my question now. Usually, that isn't a problem though. I think this the speaker had a lot of questions. Um, right. Yeah. The, okay. Hopefully, it worked out. I hope I hope yeah. they're satisfied. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's a great one. Oh, um, I think I, I may want to take a look at uh, what the video recording looks like. Uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, I should get that uh, in a few yeah. hours. A few, yeah. Um, so it, it's worthwhile to um, take a look at the um, video recording. As yeah, we can see how that By looks. default, um, there will be um, like two, two, two panels that are of the same size. Mm hmm. Um, yeah, do you think is there, um, do you think, uh, there is a better way to, to, to do this? I think, I, uh, I don't think so. I think, the, uh -huh. I don't think that I can. So I had already, I already like kind of flipped a few switches to have everyone looking at, because, you know, she's technically like, even though she's the speaker, um, WebEx doesn't technically think that she is any different than like Dr. Lee, for example. So uh -huh. she doesn't have any more privileges except for like screen sharing. So I already kind of flipped a few switches to have her um her like spotlighted. Um mm -hmm. so That's I don't know. Good. We'll see what it looks like. I'm hoping that I'm hoping that it'll look like my do, display. Uh, do you have a a few um like uh, a few more minutes? What if you make me as a printer and I print? Yeah, um, and see if you can, you know, um, find a better way to make the um, presentation screen bigger. I don't. I, I yeah, we can experiment, but I don't think I don't think it's gonna. I don't think there's gonna be another way because. Um, <laughs> okay. Here, go ahead and share the screen though. I mean, I was looking. Uh -huh. I was looking because because Dr. Lee was messaging me about it too. Um, but I I'm oh, pretty sure. Oh. She messaged you about this uh, mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure um, that it has to be done individually. All right. Okay. Now I'm sure in my slide. Um, and um, and of course, because I'm sure in my slide, I can't see the. Yeah, I mean, so so. What I what I can do so I like move you to the stage. Maybe the stage makes it worse. Actually, um, yeah, maybe the stage makes it worse. So maybe next time I won't do anything with like the stage. But then the problem there is that like, uh, people can kind of lose the speaker. But you know, next time I just won't mess with the stage because now that I'm looking at it, maybe the stage made it worse. Uh, okay. So if the if you don't do this make um, don't do the stage mode, um, mm -hmm. can we still see the camera of the, the the speaker? Yeah, but it's like way smaller. So it's uh. it's, it's it's like the size of my little cube. So uh -huh. yeah, I think what's best? I mean, um, well, I can kind of show you. Oh, I can't show you. That's the issue. <laughs> <laughs> Be yeah, a third person. Um, I think next time I just won't do the stage because I because then the presentation is bigger, but their video screen is smaller. But I guess they technically don't need that. Like we don't really need to be watching them the whole time. Because if people if people can't figure out how to like make the screen bigger, that's a problem. Yeah, that's a problem. The and <laughs> when I do um, any like virtual meetings, I tend to not. I tend not to touch any anything. Any icon. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I guess that's intuitive. I mean, I I thought that making it bigger would be clear. Like I thought people would know to do that because I I mean, but I also touch everything. 
Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. When, when you get the video, uh, let me know. Yeah, or... yeah, I will share it. I think, I think probably the stage maybe hurt more than it helped. If you, if you think that people aren't going to touch the screen. But that's okay. okay. I think overall it worked. <laughs> right. Overall it worked great. Mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, Mark is here. You can ask uh, if Mark like it or not. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, like I asked him to I asked him to join because I was I was wanting to make sure because Dr. Lee told me that he couldn't move the screen. So that's why it was like, I'm pretty sure he can. So I asked Mark to join and he could, and then I asked you and he could. And I was like, well, okay, so Dr. Lee is just not. That's not true. Like he can. There's just something not something wrong with his system. Uh -huh. um, so yeah, yeah. I was I was pulling in Mark like the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Thanks, Kelly. Yeah. Thank you. Good job. Okay. Uh, I'll see you the video when I have it. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye.